Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Icy Hot and Salon Pos and some of the other topical pain relievers. About 10% of Americans complain of chronic pain. The number increases to about 60% people over age 65. The pain typically tends to be relatively minor, some aches and pains involving the muscles or the joints, some backache, muscle spasms, some sprains or cramps. And the typical response when you have some kind of an injury, some kind of pain, is what do you do? You rub it. And as a matter of fact, the topical pain medicines are even more widely used outside the United States than they are here in the country. In Japan, they far outnumber the users of oral pain medicines. Well, if we look at the customers, who is a typical customer? It's a woman between the ages of 35 and 60, an athlete or an elderly individual who for one reason or another has some gastrointestinal upset when they take the oral pain medicines. Now the topical pain medicines are absorbed through the skin. They can come as creams or ointments or gels or sprays or lotions. And now we have different sizes of patches that slowly release the medicine over time. The topical medicines include Icy Hot and Salon Pass and Bengay and Aspercream and Absorbing Junior and Tiger Balm and Blue Emu and a variety of other substances. Just to consider the bewildering array of topical choices that you have, in Icy Hot the menthol by itself comes as a 1%, a 5%, a 7.5% or a 16% or you can get the topical with menthol of about seven and a half percent with methyl salicylate of 29 percent or it comes as lidocaine four percent with menthol one percent enormous array of options without any guidance either to the individual or to the medical profession as to what really might have a chance of working they're kind of like supplements people just take them and actually there's very little evidence that any of them work so for salon pause comes as a menthol 3%, a methyl salicylate 10%, or it comes as capsaicin 0.025% with menthol 1.25%, or lidocaine 4% with 10% benzoyl alcohol, or it comes with just plain capsaicin 0.25%, and blue amu and aspercream come with trolamine salicylate. That's related to methyl salicylate. comes as 10%. So topically, the tendency is for methyl salicylate to be present 10 to 30 percent, trolamine salicylate about 10 percent, menthol anywhere between 1 and 10 percent, but one of them has 16 percent, the optimal is about 5 percent, lidocaine typically it's 4 percent, and capsaicin 0.25 percent. You can either get them individually or in combination. They tend to cause the skin to get a little bit red, cause a little vasodilation. They smell nice if you're talking about camphor or menthol. Sometimes they're topical irritants. You put them on top of a painful joint, so it has to be relatively close to the surface of the skin, maybe the hands, the knees, the ankles. Not so much on the hip, but these medicines are big sellers. The estimated yearly revenue is about $300 million from the topical products, 60 million alone from the patches. It's dwarfed by the oral pain market. The oral pain market brings in in excess of two and a half billion dollars. But if you're going to apply this kind of medicine, the topical products, well, don't put it on broken skin, don't put it on irritated skin, don't put it under a heating pad or with a bandage, a tight bandage, an occlusive bandage. Don't put it on and then take a hot shower immediately afterward. Don't put any occlusive clothing or bandages on. Don't apply immediately before you go outside and perform activities or even to the gym and perform activities that are going to make you perspire. Don't put it on sunburned skin and certainly don't put it near or in your eyes or your nose or your mouth or your genitals. Well, after you apply the medicine, you ought to wash your hands, but obviously if you're putting it on for hand problem, well, then you wait about half an hour and then you wash. You can cover it with loose fitting clothing. That's quite all right. You can also take oral pain medicines at the same time you're using the topical products. And of course, when the pain goes away, you stop using it. Is there any scientific research that suggests that these products are significantly beneficial? 
not really, maybe a little moderate efficacy, moderate effectiveness, or poor effectiveness for that matter. At Oxford University they said, well, it's probably more helpful for acute pain than for chronic pain, but there's really a lack of good clinical trials. The improvement with acute pain, like you bang your hand or something like that, or bang your elbow, well, there's 50% improvement at a week. That's about what it is if you don't do anything. One of the benefits of using a topical medicine, at least, is that it doesn't upset your GI system. Some people, when they take aspirin or the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like naproxen or ibuprofen, are irritated. You don't get that if you just apply it topically to the skin. Well, sometime when you apply it, you might find some blistering or some swelling or some severe redness. Well, you might suffer from nausea or vomiting or ringing in your ears. Obviously, discontinue the medicine right away. Irritation could be caused by the drug itself or even by the vehicle that the drug is dissolved in. Keep it away from kids because children have accidentally misused it to brush their teeth or apply it near the eye or to taste the medicine, all of which can result in some toxicity. There were about 60,000 calls to pain centers in 2010 just because of these topical analgesic products. In 2008, a high school track star in New York applied topically some methyl salicylate, suffered cardiac arrest. Another death occurred when a person put lidocaine on the skin, on the legs, prior to hair removal, occluded it with saran, and then unfortunately suffered convulsions and a coma. In New Zealand, they report third degree burns, some requiring hospitalization, many after the first application of the topical medicines, severe burning and blistering of the skin within 24 hours after application, oftentimes with menthol more than 3% or methyl salicylate more than 10%, but some even with capsaicin. Health Canada reports about 21 cases of toxicity toxicity with methyl salicylate at the concentration anywhere between 0.75% and 11%. Spirits of camphor, 5 to 10% concentration can cause convulsions in a small child who takes just a couple teaspoons. There's menthol that's derived from peppermint oil, but if you get too much it can cause nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, it can lead to drowsiness and coma and methyl salicylate well, that can cause abdominal pain and vomiting and rapid respiration, ringing in the ears. Even just a teaspoon of extra strength, 30% methyl salicylate, sent a 30-pound child to the emergency room. Well, do these things work? There are all sorts of explanations for why they supposedly work. Whether the explanations are correct or not, nobody knows. So menthol or camphor, used since ancient time, supposedly they override the ability of the skin to feel pain. They stimulate the receptors in the skin and then they desensitize them, so they're thought to be counter-irritants. They don't really change the skin temperature. People have a broad range of temperature sensations and feelings ranging from pleasant to painful to cooling. Well, uh, correct concentration for a counter-irritant, if we're talking about menthol, might be more than one and a quarter percent. Greatest pain relief, about three and a half percent. If we're talking about menthol, supposedly it works on the nerve fibers in the skin at the junction of the top layer and the middle layer of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis. It provides weak anesthetic locally supposedly works on the kappa opioid receptors. It activates what's known as the TRPM8, that stands for transient receptor potential melastatin 8 channel. That supposedly changes the way the sodium gets into cells. If we talk about methyl salicylate, that's wintergreen oil. Actually, it's synthetically manufactured. It's not the natural plant product. It's counter-irritant acts as an anti-inflammatory, supposedly causes the skin to feel a little bit hot, the blood vessels tend to dilate, increases the skin blood flow, increases the skin temperature, reddens the skin a little bit. Supposedly it's going to decrease the prostaglandin synthesis, that's the way aspirin would work, works on something known as a Cox enzyme. It's well absorbed, but there's another salicylate, the trolamine salicylate, that's the ingredient in aspirin cream and blue amu, well, 
that doesn't seem to be absorbed quite as well as a methyl salicylate. For the methyl salicylate to work, it has to be absorbed. There's about 12 to 20 percent absorption within an hour. And then not only does it have to be absorbed, it has to be changed into salicylic acid because the methyl salicylate probably doesn't do much as far as the Cox enzymes are concerned. So supposedly it works both locally and through systemic absorption for mild to moderate pain. But the good news is, if the methyl salicylate doesn't work for your pain, it's also a flavor and a flavor and a fragrance enhancer. It's also used in breath mints and chewing gum and mouthwash and toothpaste and household disinfectants. It's used in hand creams and foot powders and hair grooming products. So if it doesn't work for one thing, it might work for something else. Methyl salicylate, well, the FDA, with the exception of Salon Pass, with the exception of Salon Pass, the FDA says, we don't really have adequate data from all these other companies. And the National Institute for Clinical and Healthcare Excellence in Britain, which is sort of the FDA equivalent, they say there's no evidence to support its use as far as capsaicin is concerned. Most people don't like capsaicin. It takes minimum two weeks, typically four to six weeks, for it to work. And during that time, there's burning sensation and stinging for several days. Feels like you're putting chili peppers on your skin. It's a counter irritant. It leads to a hot sensation. It's actually from a plant. The studies supporting its use are really of low quality. Then we have lidocaine, Lidocaine, same thing that you would get when you go to the dentist or go to the doctor for a biopsy or something. However, the topical that's used is not good enough for procedural pain. Well, there's no systemic toxicity. If it's used correctly, about 3 to 5% is going to be absorbed into the skin, into the system. It's used for back pain and joint pain and muscle pain, often combined with some of the other preparations. The Salon Pass company, Hisamatsu, was found in 1847 in Japan. They introduced the Salon Pass in 1934. Now it's available in a multitude of different forms as topical medicines, as roll-ons, with or without the different products like capsaicin. They now have as exclusive patches. Salon Pass Paid by, played by the book, and they accepted an audit, a plant audit, and that stands apart from what Johnson Johnson and Ben Gay and Icy Hot did. And as a matter of fact, that means that the only approved over-the-counter medication, approved specifically by the FDA, is the patch of the Salon Pass, and that really tipped Pfizer off. They were the manufacturers of Thermacare heat wrap. They complained that Salon Pass was advertising that they were the number one brand of patches in the entire world, the largest brand of pain patches in the United States, and the number one pain patch worldwide and in the United States. They complained to the FDA and the FTC, and the FTC said, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what they are. And just as I was preparing this broadcast, Pfizer announced a nationwide consumer-level recall of their Thermacare muscle pain therapy due to leaks and then the possibility of skin injuries. And by the way, several years ago, Tiger Balm got a warning letter from the Food and Drug Administration saying they were violating the good manufacturing practices. They had a lack of quality control. They were misbranding. They failed to monitor the suppliers. Companies had thought that the FDA wasn't going to pay any attention because they're small potatoes. That isn't the case. Well, in 2014, Consumer Reports tried to evaluate the products. They requested documents from 48 of the companies that manufacture these substances. They only got two responses. They noted that there's no current research about how well the products work. And actually, the studies that have been done vary in size and quality and duration and the number of patients with half of the studies involving fewer than 50 patients, small studies, low quality trials, they tend to overestimate the results. So we have questionable validity. So from a scientific point of view, we don't know if the substances work. And if there is some relief of pain, the question is, is it from just simply rubbing your skin? Is it from a placebo effect? Is it the passage of time? Or is it local distraction? 
Well, we don't have the answer to any of those. But my take on the entire subject is that for the overwhelming majority of people, they're relatively harmless. But time is the great healer. And if the products allow you to not take anything internally that might otherwise hurt you, then that might be relatively good. Whether they work or whether they don't work isn't really material because time is probably going to make most of the pain, the acute pain at least, go away. Is there significant evidence that the pain medicines work? Hmm. Count me as a skeptic. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.